right, this morning's reading is from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So that the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it is, and others said no, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, Yes, it's me. So they asked him, How are you now able to see? He answered, The man they called Jesus made mud and smeared it on my eyes and said, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. They asked, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on the Sabbath day. So Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told them, he put mud on my eyes. I washed, and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? He replied, he is a prophet. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. The Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he now see? His parents answered, we know he is our son, we know he was born blind, but we don't know how he now sees, and we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him, he's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's old enough, ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind, and now I see. They questioned him. What did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, This is incredible. You don't know where he's from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They responded, you were born completely in sin. How is it that you dare to teach us? Then they expelled him. Jesus heard they had expelled the man born blind. Finding him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the human one? He answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see and those who will see become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he said and asked, surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. May God add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. Lent is not an easy time in the life of a disciple, um, so why should the scriptures be either? Um, this is a very significant scripture um, as we come um, 
to study. And, and the question that is always before us, and especially in this journey of Lent, is will we choose to follow Christ? Since we have celebrated Emmanuel, God with us, all the way back at Christmas and Christ's birth, we have walked and followed Christ's teachings, and they have been a new truth, a different truth from the one that we were aware of or knew of at the time, and it's hard for that truth to break in to the systems and the structures and the understanding, both faithful and not, of the time. And so in this Lenten period where things become very concentrated right before, the Holy, right before Holy Week, we are continuing um, through the lens of Nicodemus, of the woman at the well, and now the blind man to see how God's truth is breaking into ours and where it floods the world and sets us free and where it's still hard to make room for it. We journey with Nicodemus as he's struggling to give up and leave behind what he needs to to be able to choose to follow Christ. We know that he comes in secret, so we know that just as the choir sang, he did take that one step. Um, but the Gospel of John ends with him coming to care for Jesus' body, so there was another step, but these are still steps made in secret. And so they are still limiting what God and God's truth breaking in can do and can transform. The woman at the well um, takes lots of steps. In fact, her steps are running back to the very same people she was running from to be able to bring them to show and to have them meet Jesus and to find what she found in the joy and in the salvation of a conversation in which she was honest, in which she, like Nicodemus, didn't get what was going on at first, but how she, unlike Nicodemus, kept the curiosity up and kept asking and trying to figure out this new truth that was before her. And she succeeded in making room for it in such a way that it did change her life. And not only hers, but the life of so many in the community with her because of the witness that happened. And so we come to today. We come to the story of the blind man. And Barry, if you'll put it up, um, how many times have we passed by others in our lives and talk about them without talking to them? Do you see how this story pass it starts? As he passed by, he saw a blind man from his birth, and as Jesus is seeing him, his disciples are seeing him, but they start talking about him. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're ready for the theological discussion that has nothing to do with the person that is right next to him. Think of Patch Adams, the movie, if you will, right? That scene in the hospital where the medics are all surrounding this poor woman on the bed, and they're like, oh, she is this and that, and Patch stops and is like, what's your name? Like, hello, you are present, you are here. Um, and let's start with just acknowledging that. Um, and so this whole thing comes, and, and Jesus um, heals this blind man's eyes. Um, but honestly, it's not for the blind man. It's because the others were so blind that that's the only way that the rest of us could see. It's really hard a new truth, a divine truth breaking into the world. It's totally different than anything that we know or are comfortable with or have experience with. It is completely other. And if we can think of what it is to live in a world as a blind person or as any other person where the world is not set up for them. The world is set up for sighted people. It's the water that we swim in, so we don't even recognize it or know that it's there. But this man knows it um, because it is his everyday life of figuring out how to live in a world that is not made for him. The funny thing is, that's our call as disciples to figure out how to live in a world that is not made for us in its current state, that is meant to be something different 
that is meant to be this kingdom of truth that Christ is desperately trying to open our eyes and our hearts and our souls and our minds to. And this blind man is a personal hero in faith for me because this happens. And not only has he figured out a way to live in a world that's not meant for him, but a way to live in a world that blames him um, for why it is what it is, because clearly he or his parents sinned. If we go on, um, he has washed. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? What does it say of the community that one master status changed and they don't know this person? The one identifying factor, the only thing that they saw is now removed and they're having trouble seeing anything else. The next, some said, it is he. Others said, oh, but no, it's somebody like him. Again, are they talking to the man yet? Anyone? And he's this poor man. I am he. I am the man. Hello. Anybody want to listen? Anybody want to talk to me? And he tries. He tries to tell the story. And they can't even enter in the joy of the story of the moment. They can't even talk or look or be excited about the transformation that's happened. They've got to control it. Nope. Where is he? Who did this to you? What? I don't know. Why should I be Why should I know? Keep going. So they brought him to the Pharisees um, because it was the Sabbath day and clearly not something of God can happen on a Sabbath day where it's a day meant for wholeness. Again, we're talking about our own hangups here. Um, and the Pharisees are asking him, and he's saying, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I can see. I'm here. Well, nope, nope, this couldn't have happened. Keep going, Barry. Um, but then others are like, well, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? Maybe there is something here. And so once again, they're the division and the back and the forth. Um, and so again, they're having their own discussion. And then all of a sudden, as an afterthought, turn to the blind man. What did you say about him since he's opened your eyes? And now here's his chance, right? He is a prophet. But still, that truth is too much. There's no room for that truth in this place and in this system. And so once again, that wasn't the answer that they wanted. So the authorities and the ruling leaders of that community call in his parents um, and triangle his parents right in, and they're afraid. No one is with this man all again. The thing that they said was wrong with him has been miraculously changed and healed and transformed. But still, he's the problem. Still, they can't talk with him or hear truth for him or be present with him. The community is debating whether it's him. His neighbors are struggling with whether they recognize him or not. His leaders aren't celebrating with him, but blaming him again, and his parents abandon him. This man is one of my heroes of faith because I don't know how he had the strength to still claim the truth that Jesus had revealed to him and had given to him. Clearly, there was character built way before this moment ever happened. But when no one else was able to see or acknowledge the truth that was in front of him that he was witnessing to, he stuck with it. Even though no one else could see it and no one else could accept it, he claimed it and did not falter. And so even when he was called in again, Barry, before the synagogue to be asked again, and, and do you see the manipulation that's happening? These leaders who are the keepers of this truth and of this praise, give God glory, praise the way we want you to in the truth that we want to hear. And he does it. He speaks truth to power with no support, with nothing around him. 
and stays faithful and is expelled because of it. Just when the thing that is keeping him from being a part of the community is healed, the community finds another way to kick him out. But Jesus finds him. Jesus, the good shepherd, finds him and goes to his sheep and has a conversation with him. Much like that Peter, you know, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am, Barry? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the human one? Oh, keep going, Barry. Thanks. Um, and, it, and one more. Yeah, it took a really long time. The Pharisees were debating for a really long time. Um, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have seen him. It is he who speaks to you. You have seen him and you have heard him. And you know his voice. And that is when the worship happens, right? That is when the worship in spirit and in truth that the, good, that the Samaritan woman at the well talked about, this is what happens. Bury the next slide. I believe. And the strength of that stance does finally crack a little bit into the world of the others. And we end with the haunting question, are we also blind? This is my greatest fear and my calling as pastor, that in doing all that I can to safeguard and protect the church, because this is not a malintentioned thing. The Pharisees have done everything that they can to protect the Jewish faith and their community in the midst of an onslaught of oppression from the Roman government. They have done what they could to preserve identity and preserve faith, but even as good intention and as committed as they were to this, they missed the truth when it came. And that's what terrifies. And the thing that meets this terror, the question for today, is whether or not we know God's voice. What I love from my study and the commentary um, for this week that I've never put together before is that this story is a long one and it doesn't end with chapter 9. It continues into chapter 10. The whole story of Jesus as the good shepherd is to explain what happened in this scripture with the blind man. The last bit of this story is them debating um, in chapter 10 um, of he is a demon and is out of his mind. Why listen to him? And others were saying these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And so to answer the haunting question of the Pharisees, are we blind? Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus speaks, very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me shall be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. This is exactly what happened for the blind man, of finding life provided for him. What Christ is here to give all of us, why we are practicing this financial fast of being a part of that providing work so that all might find the pasture that they need. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is our call as disciples. And it is a call that we can only live into if we are the sheep who know our shepherd's voice and who know who he is and who know who other shepherds are not. And as Mrs. Jacobs preached in our very first Sunday here at Lent, um, there's a lot of temptation, and there's a lot of voices to listen to, and Eve spent too much time talking with the serpent. 
And the very first thing that that serpent did was to sow doubt into what exactly Jesus and what God did and didn't say. This is our call, this Lenten time, this journey, to know our shepherd's voice and to be ready to be carried, to be ready to be greeted, to come and to have life and have it abundantly, not just for us, but for others too, for that whole village and community that the Samaritan woman ran back to bring in. For the people that we don't think deserve it, but that God has other plans for. I want to close um, with a little bit from the um, last battle from the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, in this very last period, right, this book is about a false prophet, a false Aslan, a donkey being dressed up in the lion skin, and the real Aslan, and all of the damage that the fake Aslan did because people hadn't seen Aslan in so long, they had forgotten the sound of his voice. And so even though this false Aslan was ordering all kinds of evil and harm, they did it because they thought they were following the true Aslan and didn't take time to question or see the results. This blind man says, I can't explain what happened, but before I didn't see, and now I do. I know the change that happened in me. And so even if we're having trouble discerning whose voice is whose, what we can do is look and see what is coming from that voice. And whether it's healing and wholeness and life abundant or destruction and death. And so in this last scene where Aslan comes back and all is taken care of and um, all of Narnia is invited into the fullness of what God's truth will look like, right? When God's truth breaks into our world in completion, when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And of course, this is all in the language of food, which is why I remember it, because this is what I'm ready for, that heavenly banquet. Um, what was the fruit like? Unfortunately, no one can describe a taste. All I can say that is compared with those fruits, the freshest grapefruit you've ever eaten was dull. The juiciest orange was dry. The most melting pear was hard and woody. And the sweetest wild strawberry was sour. And there were no seeds or stones and no wasps. If you had once eaten that fruit, all the nicest things in this world would taste like medicines after it. But I can't describe it. You can't find out what it is like unless you can get to that country and taste for yourself. And there were tons of people, both that surprised them and didn't, that were flooding into this country in this last chapter, except for a group of dwarves who were so afraid of being taken in and fooled again that they would not accept the abundance that was set before them. And Lucy, of course, the tender one, is beside herself and has tried to open them up to what's happening, has pulled everybody else that she can get to try to help them see because she wants them to taste the abundance that is before them. And finally, she recruits Aslan. And dearest, said Aslan, I will show you both what I can and what I cannot do. He came, came close to the dwarves and gave a long growl, low, but it set all the air shaking. And the dwarves said to one another, hear that? That's the gang at the other end of the stable trying to frighten us. They do it with a machine of some kind. Don't take any notice. This won't take us in again. Aslan raised his head and shook his mane, and instantly a glorious feast appeared on the dwarves' knees. Pies and tongues and pigeons and trifles and ices. And each dwarf had a goblet of good wine in his right hand. That's the heaven I'm a part of. Um, but it wasn't much use. They began eating and drinking greedily enough, but it was clear that they couldn't taste it properly. They thought they were eating and drinking only the sort of things you might find in a stable. One said he was trying to eat hay, and another said he got a bit of an old turnip, and a third said he'd found a raw cabbage leaf. And they raised golden goblets of rich red wine to their lips and said, Ugh, fancy drinking dirty water out of a trough that a donkey's been at. Never thought we'd come to this. And a brawl continues, and Aslan turns to Lucy and says, You see, they will not let us help them. 
They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison is only in their minds, yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. May this not be our end. May our end be one of having life and having it abundantly.